So that's the problem. And it and I do think it contributes to depression. And I think it contributes to anxiety, which is uh, which is why people are so paralyzed. Mm-hmm. They're so worried that they're going to make a decision that they'll regret that they don't make a decision at all. Barry Schwartz, this is such an honor to do this. I have known about your work for many, many years. Welcome to the show. It's wonderful to meet you. And thanks for coming on. Thank you, Dan. You're very kind. My pleasure. I would love to maybe begin this conversation with perhaps where you begin the book, which is the genesis story, as I understand it, of how the book, The Paradox of Choice, came to be in the first place. And you tell a story about going to buy jeans many years ago. Maybe for the audience, it would be helpful to set the set the story and the the background here as to what made you write this book in the first place personally and where where it really sure. the the ideas come from to begin with. So um, I, I used to wear jeans before COVID where I switched to pants that have elastic waists. <laughs> I, used, I used to wear jeans every day. Yeah. And I wore them until they disintegrated because I hated breaking in new jeans. So my wife refused to be seen in public with me anymore. So I went to replace my jeans and I went to the Gap, which is where I buy them. And I told them my size. And, and uh, you know, this was usually a 40 second um, exchange. Um, but the, the sales clerk said, do you want slim fit, easy fit, relaxed fit, button fly, zipper fly, boot cut? Uh, acid wash, stone wash, blah, blah, blah. And, I, mm. and I said, I want the kind that used to be the only kind. But of course, they didn't make that kind anymore. Yeah. So, so what happened is I spent 40 minutes trying on all the different versions that they now had available. And I walked out with the best fitting jeans I had ever owned. In other words, I did better. Mm. And I felt worse. And the question was why, and that's really what gave rise to the book. Um, And I think the answer to the question why is that when genes only come in one flavor, your expectations are limited. You know, unless you're a model, they're not going to fit you perfectly. When they come in a million flavors, now you expect perfection. And what I got was certainly good, but it wasn't perfection. So what happened was my expectations went from here to here. And the realization went from here to here. So even though I did better, I felt like I had failed. And if I had spent more time or gone to more stores or something, I'd ended up doing better. So this led me to start looking around to see if there was much research on the problem that arises when people have too much choice. And there wasn't much research. There was a little bit of research. Um, And the one that the the studies that really grabbed me were done at Stanford, um, where um, people go into this gourmet food store and one day there are 24 different flavors of jam out on a table for people to sample. And then another day there are six. And the question is, how many people sample and how many people buy? And and what the researchers found is that more people are attracted to the table when there are lots of different flavors, but one-tenth as many people actually buy. Hmm. And what that told me is that rather than liberating people, all this choice can paralyze you know, I don't know how I'm going to decide. I can't figure out what to choose. The hell with it. Hmm. I'll buy jam another time. So the so that's paradox number one. Um, you you should feel free to find exactly what you want, and instead you feel paralyzed. And paradox number two is that even if you overcome paralysis and choose, you end up less satisfied than you would have been if there had been fewer options to choose from. So that led to the book. Mm. Uh, the book, it should be said, is now almost 20 years old. Uh, and the problem was bad in 2005. And it is now orders of magnitude worse. Because the internet had really not even begun to show itself as the retail monster that it is. You know, Amazon sold books. 
And that was sort of it. And now, uh, you know, how many pairs of jeans can you examine online? Thousands. Mm. Uh, so, and, and I, you know, I think, I don't have direct evidence for this, that one of the reasons that young people are so plagued by indecision about what to do with their lives, uh, um, anxiety, and depression, is that they're confronted with a world where anything and everything is possible in trivial things like what should I do on Friday night and very consequential things like what should I major in? What kind of job should I look for? Where should I live? Should I get married? And they don't know how to decide. Hmm. And they somehow think that they should know how to decide that the, they don't think that this is the world's problem. They think it's their problem. And the result I think is real, real unease. Uh, with their current state and and with how to shape a future. So I don't think it's just about being disappointed in the genes you buy. I think it really can lead to very serious consequences. This is a huge reason why I was hoping to be able to speak with you because of exactly the point you just made. It, it's amazing. In the last you know, few days as I've been preparing for this conversation, there's a PBS special that profiles you you know 15 20 years ago as the book is coming out roughly speaking and this is pre iphone and you're going over all of the decision fatigue that people have around the holidays of trying oh, to decide yeah, yeah, what to yeah. buy for christmas presents and for themselves and there there's a quote that i i love which i think goes to the heart of what a lot of what the book is about which is quote there's no question that some choice is better than none but it doesn't follow from that that more choice is better than some choice. And you just said this, that the problem is now orders of magnitude worse than when the book came out now. And your message, I think, is certainly one I need to keep in mind in my own personal life, but it seems evergreen and will increasingly become evergreen as the internet provides more and more choices to to people in this world. You I'd know, unfortunately, I think you're right. It, it is possible that people will learn how to cope with it. You know, like it, it, it was a kind of a shock to the world when it first started. And people like me who are not digital natives find it, it continues to be a shock. But maybe people who grow up with all of this will find um, ways to cope that I couldn't imagine. I don't think that's likely because if it were likely, they would have found ways to cope and they wouldn't be so miserable. So I really do think, you know, there's a cartoon that I sometimes show from the New Yorker. I think when I, at the end of my talk of a, you see a big fish and a little fish in a fishbowl. Um, and the caption reads, you can be anything you want to be, no limits. Mm. And, you know, you're supposed to look at this and laugh because the parent fish is so myopic no limits, right? Yeah. I mean, there's nothing really going on in the fishbowl. <laughs> and that was my first reaction. But what I came to see, and what I came to think my book was about, was that everybody needs a fishbowl. Mm. And there needs to be more in it than a plastic castle and some gravel for, for human beings. But mm. the notion that by shattering the fishbowl and making anything possible, you improve people's lives, that's the mistake. And the question is, what kind of a fishbowl do people need? What kind of constraints do people need so that they really are free to find a path and, and uh, to make choices, but not paralyzed by all of its free? So, so it's a serious issue. And I see no sign that anyone is willing to give up all this choice. Mm. You know, young people think that the problem is mine, not theirs. That they, you know, they're masters of the universe. They can cope, um, and uh, and the kind of fear of missing out that dominates their lives, they just don't fully appreciate. Uh, so it's very difficult to convince young people that a, a, a sort of constructing a world where they have fewer options would improve their lives. Hmm. Um, older people, I think, have sort of learned the hard way. That limited op limiting options is a good thing, um, as long as they're not too limited. Um, but at young people, I I have not been able 
to reach young people and convince them. Hmm. I just got an email today from somebody who gra- went to Penn, graduated. It, it somehow find my, found my book, started reading it, and saw, thought that I had written his biography. Hmm. And all the stuff that I was writing about how people are suffering were an exactly accurate description of him. So he sent me an email and said, I can't tell you how much you've helped me understand the agony I'm going hmm. through. <laughs> You know, my response was, well, thanks, but I, I wish I could help you out of the act. <laughs> Don't know how to do that. Hmm. It's so. a large, it's a large, you know, reason. Another reason why I wanted to, to talk to you as well is to try to provide some wisdom from your perspective to people who may come across this interview or like this person who just emailed you They're They think you're, they resonate with what you're saying in your, in your book. And one of the points that I know I've heard you kind of harp on in a lot of your presentations about the book is how, you know, a bedrock belief in America, Western civilization in general is, is about freedom and that we cherish that notion. But at the same time, to your point, I think of what you were just alluding to a minute ago, we all need a bit of a fishbowl. At least most people seem to need some limits on their freedom and that just being able to do a limitless number of things can lead to this sort of paralysis that paralysis that you're talking about. So I I'd love to give you an opportunity to speak about the concept of freedom, how you think about that in our culture and how it relates to the general principles and ideas in the book. So, you know, I, I, yeah, I do try to suggest that this is like, this is in the water supply in places like the United States. And most people equate freedom with choice. And in a certain sense, that makes sense, too, since, it, you know, in what sense are you free if there aren't options? Mm. Um, you know, it isn't it isn't the Constitution and the Declaration of Independence that make make us free. What makes us free is that you, there are actually different things you might do, different paths you might follow. So all of that makes sense. Um, but it's not, you know, it's not an unmitigated good. It creates challenges that we can't meet. So way, finding ways to limit your options. Uh, one, one piece of advice I give in the book is choose when to choose. Mm. So if you need a new cell phone, instead of you know scrutinizing everything that's available on the market, call your friend who recently got a new cell phone and say, what, what, what kind did you get? And do you like it? Uh, and what plan did you choose? And if your friend is, you know, positive, just do it. Hmm. So you're basically delegating, you're offloading that particular decision to someone else. Hmm. Now, is the phone that you end up getting going to be the perfect phone for you? Probably not. Does it matter? Certainly not. Hmm. Uh, and that's another piece of advice I give. We have this sense that the 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 task whenever we make a decision is to find the best. Mm. And that is what leads to all the trouble because when, when there are three kinds of genes, it's not so hard to look for the best. Looking for the best means you look at everything, but there are only three things to look at. When there are 30,000 kinds of genes, how do you know you've got the best until you've examined every possibility? And so if that's your aim, then you have to do an exhaustive search. And in the world we currently live in, an exhaustive search is either impossible or exhausting. Mm -hmm. If you're looking for a good enough pair of jeans or a good enough place to have dinner or a good enough place to go on vacation, you don't need to do an exhaustive search. You just need to know what your standards are and look until you find something that meets your standards and then stop looking. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and it seems it it really you know it's it, the word that people often use to dis, to to paraphrase what I just said is that that's settling, mm. and settling is not a neutral description. Settling is a criticism. Mm. You settled for that, you know. So that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We shouldn't be settling. We should looking be looking for the best all the time. Uh, I call people who do that maximizers. Um, And I think a much better strategy, both in terms of efficiency and time and satisfaction with decisions, is to look for good enough. 
and I call people who do that satisficers. Hmm. And we all do it sometimes. Nobody is looking for the best possible postage stamps, right? You just want stamps that have the right value so that your letters will actually go where they're meant to go. Hmm. Um, so we know how to settle for good enough. But the trouble is that we don't use that standard in enough areas of our lives. And if we used it in more that standard in more areas of our lives, I think the choice problem would suddenly become much more manageable. Hmm. You know, I know a lot of this is just f- decision fatigue, and that this was popularized. I think when Steve Jobs was alive, that he wears he wore same the same same clothes every day. And you know, when Obama was president, I remember that he had I think three suits that he would select from every day just to not bog himself down with too many decisions. And you know. Um, let me just speak to that. The, uh, the, the, the writer Michael Lewis did an interview with Obama mm. uh, for, I think, Vanity Fair. And one of the questions he asked, I guess a more frivolous question, was how come he's always wearing a white shirt and, you know, he just seems to have the, this small set of suits that he rotates. And, and Obama gives him this, like, look and says... Have you got any idea how many decisions I have to make in a day? Do you really want me spending time and mental energy deciding what to wear? Hmm. (laughs) And, you know, it's like all of a sudden, ah, of course, that makes sense. Hmm. So, yes, you can, you can, you know, sort of, you can be an architect of the choice environment you live in. But it's going to take practice in the short run. It's going to feel like you're leaving you're leaving money on the table. You're leaving opportunities on the table. Let's just let's just look at one more poster of it before mm-hmm. we buy. And and the fact that you can do it all online makes it so easy to look at just one more. You don't have to get into the car and drive to another store. You know, you can just click. So why stop? Mm-hmm. You're trying to decide what movie to watch on Netflix on a Friday night. How many uh, options do you look at before you say, OK, enough, I'll just pick one. Hmm. It's so easy to just look at one more. I think you hit on a truth that many people, including me, are a, a bit reluctant to admit, which is that if you are a maximizer and you're looking for the perfect movie on a Friday night, you may end up picking a better movie, but you feel worse. You do. And it's that feeling worse that I think for many people is almost shameful, something that they don't like to readily admit that all of that searching was not a net benefit for them. And, you know, this is something that I know I wanted to bring up with you about. And I, this is still a phrase that I hear in popular culture of maximizer versus satisficer. And what are your thoughts on, you know, for people, for example, that get very into becoming a musician or very into podcasting, being a maximizer with intention in very small, specific areas of their life, and then philosophically deciding that they will be a satisficer in the other areas. Do you think that that, in some circumstances, is the wise perspective to kind of allocate a satisficer mentality to things that don't really matter to you, but for the things that really do having more of a maximizer mentality, or do you have a different view of that in general? I have a slightly different view. I do think that, you know, if you love cars, Mm. if you're really into cars, um, then there's a certain sense in which there can't be too many options Mm. because you roll up your sleeves and you look at all the specs and the more the better. Mm. But you don't want every aspect of your life to be like that. So you shut down the options in other areas that you don't care about. And with cars, it's bring it on. Hmm. Um, So, but I think, so I do think that being selective makes sense, but I don't think that the right attitude is if it's important, I'll be a maximizer. And if it's not important, I'll be a satisficer. I think really it, it is often the important decisions where being a maximizer serves you worst. Hmm. You know, you get out of college and you're looking for jobs and you're a very good student and you get a whole bunch of job offers and you want the best job. Well, this is not we did a study of college seniors. We tracked them 
from October of their senior year until they graduated. And some of them were maximizers and some weren't. And we found that maximizers got better jobs and they felt worse about the jobs they got. So, you know, what, what matters here is, is it the quality objectively of what you end up with or is it how you feel about what you end up with? Now, within obviously objective quality is relevant, but it doesn't do much good to do better and feel worse. Hmm. You know, you, you, every day you go to work, you're thinking, oh, I could, would have been happier somewhere else. Well, that's, that's no way to go through life. There's another cartoon that I sometimes show of a young woman with a sweatshirt that says, brown, but my first choice was Yale. <laughs> it is funny, but imagine getting up every morning and having that sentence run through your head. Hmm. Are you going to get as much out of being at Brown as you can? You know, Brown is a spectacular institution. But if every day you think that you'd be thriving even more at Yale, you're not going to take advantage of what Brown has to offer. You're mm -hmm. going to be thinking of what you're missing out on. So and that's an important thing, you know, where to go, go to college, a big deal. And mm -hmm. so you think I want the place that's the best fit for me. All that does is encourage it makes drives people crazy. So I I don't think it's about important versus unimportant. Um, and the other thing is, I think it's important to distinguish um, what we sometimes call perfectionism from maximizing. Mm -hmm. So you do these podcasts and you want them to be really, really high quality. Mm -hmm. And so you sweat the details and somebody else looking from the outside, does it really matter? Does the sound quality have to be perfect? Blah, 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 blah. And yes, from your point of view, it does. Now, have you ever done a perfect podcast? I'm guessing that the answer is no. Mm -hmm. You have very high standards, but you can see better than anyone else what's, what's wrong with mm -hmm. this podcast, how it falls just a little bit short of what you are hoping for. And what I think about is the basketball player, Michael Jordan, who I'm assuming you're old enough to remember. Sure, absolutely. Well, you know, by reputation, he was a savage in practice. He demanded of his teammates and himself only the best every second of every game and even every second of every practice. Do you think he thinks he ever played a perfect game? Hmm. I think he doesn't. But do you think he got satisfaction out of playing as well as he did, I'm sure he did get satisfaction in addition to reams of money. Hmm. So he has this incredibly high standard, but he knows he can't meet it. Hmm. So it's an aspiration that keeps you working hard, keeps you focused on goals, but it, you're also realistic. And I so I think there are a lot of people who go through life like that. I want this to be perfect, even though I know that's not possible. That's what gets me up in the morning. That's what keeps me at the editing desk. I want this to be perfect. Um, but I get plenty out of plenty of satisfaction out of things that are really, really good, even though I know they're not perfect. And I think with maximizers, that's not the case. I think if they want the best, they want the best. Hmm. They don't want good. And they're going to look for the best so they can get good. They want the best. And if all they end up with is good, they're going to feel like they failed. So I think that's an important distinction, uh, uh, which explains why perfectionists can be quite content with the kinds of things they achieve, even if they fall short of perfection. And maximizers are plagued mm. by what they've left behind, what they've said no to, that maybe they should have said yes to. You, I know, have spoken about you know, your view that while it's not likely the sole contributor to depression in younger people that you know I, my understanding is that it's your your view that a, a component to that increasing phenomenon seemingly among young people is exactly what you just spoke about a few minutes a few minutes ago which is that if you get into brown and every morning you're r lamenting the fact that you didn't get into yale that's a hell of a way to live even though objectively speaking you are at one of the best institutions in the world obviously that principle can be applied to many different areas of life 
Absolutely. Speak to that if you can. You know, you get a job at Amazon, but you don't get a job at Google. I mean, mm. for you, you got a job at Amazon. Um, so the problem with seeking the best is that you look at so many options that the one you end up with suffers by comparison. And and the consequence is that you sort of feel like you have failed and mm. that you there are missed opportunities at, at Yale that you're never going to be able to experience. And the contrast between what you're how good you're imagining Yale would be and how good you're experiencing Brown actually is makes Brown worse in your estimation. So, yeah, uh, you know, I mean, imagine going through life thinking that every decision you make is a failure or a mistake. Hmm. Uh, so that's the problem and it and I do think it contributes to depression and I think it contributes to anxiety which is uh, which is why people are so paralyzed hmm. they're so worried that they're going to make a decision that they'll regret that they don't make a decision at all I think you are hitting on something that in my mind is rather chronic in the culture I certainly see aspects of this in in me and uh, you know the the way out of this, you know, I don't know if you view this maximizer mentality as almost like a mild version of a uh, a mental illness because of its ability to corrode your quality of life. You know, I, I don't know if there are certain types of people that are most kind of predisposed to go through life in this way where they're just, it is an insatiable hungry ghost that they are chasing all the time. How do you talk to somebody who is an admitted maximizer to begin to try to adjust their psychology, their their mindset to maybe, you know, begin to quote unquote settle in some areas of their life, but doing so intentionally for a better life itself? What th these things are, I think, are really deeply wired in people, especially if they've been reinforced over many, many years. How do you, I'm sure so many people have come to you, you know, in the past 20 years or so, how do you address those people? What do you say? I, we basically have the same conversation that you and I are having. Mm. And, and what I tell people, and I, and I spend a fair amount of time talking about this in the book too, is that don't think this is something that's like, it's not like taking a pill. Mm. It's not like you snap your finger. Ah, this is my problem. Starting tomorrow, I'm going to be a satisficer. And so from tomorrow on, you feel wonderful about everything. It's going to feel uncomfortable. It's going to feel like you're leaving opportunities behind that you ought to be taking advantage of. Hmm. It, you have to stick with it, I think, and work through the discomfort until you essentially have developed a new set of habits for hmm. decision making. And when you discover that you're actually enjoying the restaurants you go to just as much as you used to, Mm -hmm. uh, but you're spending a quarter of the time deciding what restaurants to go to. And you're actually enjoying the things you order at the restaurant just as much as you used to. But you're spending a quarter of the time deciding what to choose from the restaurant menu. Slowly, it, get, it feels more natural, more comfortable, and you experience the benefits. Mm -hmm. But if you expect an instant fix, then you're not going to stick with it long enough to experience those benefits. So in the short run, my fear is it's painful for people to uh, try to change their decision-making habits. And, in, and they have to be prepared to be uncomfortable and just push through. Hmm. Uh, I don't know that there's an easy way to do this. Uh, so I kind of warn people if they really do think that I've put my finger on something that's plaguing them, then they have to be willing to do a little more suffering it, you know, it's like running a marathon. It feels great when you get to the finish line. But those last five miles, you keep asking yourself with every step, why the hell did I do this? <laughs> totally. You know, some some aspect of this, too, I would imagine you would agree with is a recognition of limits, of placing intentional limits yep. on yourself. And that that might be, you know, a, a crucial first step to change is recognizing that it's almost within the parameters of your own fishbowl that you're creating that flourishing is on, is is possible. I don't know if you agree with that general. I sentiment. do agree with it. The problem with self-imposed limits is that they're self-imposed. Mm -hmm. 
And it's so easy to look at one more toaster of, you know, so you need something that will discipline you to stick to the limits. You know, a lot of people, for example, who are trying to control their use of devices mm -hmm. will put will will lock them in a safe. That's timed. So, you know, at, at dinner, the phone goes into the safe and it does. The safe doesn't open until six o'clock the next morning. And they feel sort of dirty about it. You know, mm -hmm. it's like. I ought to be able to control this without gimmicks. And uh, the truth is they can't. And there's nothing wrong with using a gimmick. So getting help from outside uh, to help to, to, to um, encourage you to stick to these limits that you impose on yourself is probably a good idea. There's um, people who are trying to break bad habits, you know, like, quit smoking or lose weight, stop taking drugs, whatever it is, uh, you can make a vow, you know, this is the last, this is the last alcohol I'm going to have, or mm -hmm. no more than one glass of wine uh, a day or whatever it is. And then of course you have to stick to it and sticking to it is close to impossible. Um, th there's this device that behavioral device that people came up with where a, you make it public. You make a public declaration, hmm. and then you'll be ashamed when your friends and family see you violating <laughs> your commitment. And second, you put you put something you care about up at stake. So the the best, the most effective um, example of this that I've heard about, it you write a check, let's say a $2,000 check to go to the Donald Trump reelection campaign. Hmm. And you are a very left-wing Democrat. If you violate your commitment, that check gets mailed. Hmm. And now you've got really strong reasons not to violate the commitment. So pick something you hate, commit resources to it, conditional on your not being able to live up to your commitments and it will it, it'll provide just enough sort of external support to make it harder for you to succumb to temptation hmm. and i think that works i about a year and a half ago interviewed anna lemke who leads the stanford addiction clinic and she wrote a book called dopamine nation and she spoke about similar ideas. I mean, I kept thinking about the book Atomic Habits when you were talking about how so much of this is just feedback loops and creating incentives for yourself to behave in the way that are are in alignment with your actual goals. One of the things that Anna said is that uh, one of the first moves she often makes with people who come to her with addictions, some of which you uh, spoke about earlier, smoking or or alcohol, is a 30-day cessation from those activities. And if that can be held, it's often hell at the beginning, but the success rate is often very good. You kind of, ha things have to get worse before they get better yeah. um, in, in many, in many circumstances. And, you know, I want to talk about the culture itself. And I have to imagine so much of this maximizing mentality, it has to be close to as bad in America as anywhere else. And we talked about freedom and the uh, how rooted America is in that general idea. What else do you think is fueling this um, real ailment and habit structure that so many Americans are uh, falling prey to in your mind? Is it, you know, obviously the advent of social media has happened since the book has come out, but what, what else do you point to that's really exacerbating this problem and making people, you know, very potentially less satisfied and happy, happy than they might otherwise be? Well, I don't think there's a simple answer to that. I'm sorry, I'm just turning my phone off. Sure. So it doesn't. Uh... Um, I, th what I'm about to say is more speculative than anything, because I don't think any of this is uniquely American. Hmm. But what I said before about how people think satisfying is settling, I think reveals what the ideology is in this country about what your uh, aspirations should be. 
you know, no matter how much you have, it's not enough. No matter how successful you are, it's not enough. There's always another rung and you should always be trying to get onto that other rung. And that can just, you know, be metaphorical or it can be literal, you know? So, you know, top of the top of the pyramid or is success. Anything else is failure. Um, a, a house in the Hamptons on three acres of land right by the ocean is success. A block from the ocean is failure and so mm -hmm. on and so on. And that seems to me to be what we are taught to want. Mm -hmm. um, we it, and social media is terrible in this regard because it is so much easier to compare yourself to other people that you in effect your nose is rubbed in your failure on a daily hourly minute by minute basis and even though you kind of know that the picture of life other people are presenting isn't real because you're doing it yourself hmm. you 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 still think well my life could be better than it is my life could be as good as his life uh you know he's got a 28 foot boat i just have a 18 foot boat uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So, you know, in, in the in America, new and improved are the adjectives that go with every product and service I can think of. Hmm. Do you really need a new iPhone every year? There are people who think the answer to that is yes, hmm. that they, they get online to get the new one the minute they come to market, even though the one they have will serve them well for another five years. Why is that? Because it seems un-American not to want bigger, better, and faster. Um, and, uh, and I think you kind of get indoctrinated into that, and you're regarded as not having ambition if you don't behave in that way. Now, if you aspire to, you know, sort of create the best AI code in the service of uh, enabling people to do their work better, uh, far be it for me to criticize you for having these very high aspirations. But choosing the best, you know, chasing after the best things is a waste of time, energy, and uh, potential. Um, chasing after the best th things you can give to the world is not a waste of uh, mm. of e energy and potential. So, so I think we're misdirected um, in uh, in the direction. You know, he, whoever dies with the most toys wins. We're mm. kind of misdirected in that direction uh, by design. And it takes a lot to resist that temptation mm. because everyone around you seems to be chasing after the better, faster, uh, more expensive. So I, I think, I don't know how you resist it. Mm. Um, you know, some people are lucky uh, and they're just never tempted by all the glitz, but most people find it very difficult to resist the temptation. And other people look at them strangely when they do resist the temptation. You know, it's like they're from another planet. So this is a kind of superficial analysis. I, and I don't know, by the way, that this is uniquely American. It would not surprise me if something similar were true in uh, Europe. But there is, in, in you know, in countries with a long history of democratic institutions and free market economic structure, I would expect to see some of this. But here, this might be a, a reason why a U.S. is different. In most countries in Europe, the social safety net is so substantial that the, the sort of pursuit of goods and services is self-limited. Hmm. Because in most areas of life, there's no need to. You know, the state takes care of you. Hmm. State takes care of education and health care and, and retirement and so on. Uh, 
in America, the safety net is really weak. It's the weakest safety net of any rich country. And so the, the sort of counter model, which is you don't always have to be striving for more, you don't always have to be striving for better, doesn't exist in the United States in the way it does in, uh, in uh, you know, rich dem democracies in Europe. And maybe that puts a limit on people's aspirations, that, which serves them well. And make any sense to you? You are. And, you know, one of my all time favorite quotes is that not wanting something is as good as having it. And, <laughs> you know, Anna, Anna, one of the things that Anna talked about when we were talking about addiction was her view that, you know, one of the rarely spoken about addictions is workaholism, which I think is related to a lot of what you just spoke about in in terms of never feeling accomplished enough or doing enough and that there's something in the in the water here that drives people to just always feel like they haven't achieved enough i've always been curious as to whether some of this is rooted in the religious orientation and genesis of the country in that the view of original sin that you're born sick and that they're through acts and effort that's how you gain your salvation obviously like this is a secular version of that potentially but I, I was curious if that had had been something that had crossed your mind over the years of speaking about this well you know look it's certainly possible uh although not that would not be uniquely american right uh, the i have mixed feelings about workaholism hmm. Because it seems to me, it, it, you know, I think that this is there's a little bit of the Michael Jordan example here. Uh, you know, I write a book. I, I'm reading a fourth draft. And I know I can make it better. Hmm. Well, when I write the fifth draft, I'll, I know I'll be able to make that one better, too. So I can write draft after draft after draft of this book uh, until I go quietly to my grave and nobody sees it. Hmm can always make it better. So aspiring to produce a great book uh, of social science that says important things, but at the same time is accessible to a wide audience, that's a noble ambition. Hmm. And putting really slaving over it so that you can make complicated things easy to understand, that's a noble ambition. You know, you're trying to democratize knowledge and make mm. esoteric things not esoteric, not mysterious. But the critical thing is to be able to fail and be satisfied with the failure because it's so damn good. Mm. You know, and that so Michael Jordan could do that. Um, I, I'm pretty good at that. You know, every book I've ever written, I could see what was wrong with it. And I was still able to get a lot of satisfaction out of what I was able to produce, you know, and, you know, so think and thinking about it all the time, whether I'm actually working on it or not, contributed to the quality of it. So it seems to me that thinking about work all the time isn't so bad if you're doing it for good reasons. Mm. It's only bad if you're doing it for bad reasons. Mm. And a lot of people are doing it for bad reasons. And I mean, there are other problems, of course. If you're thinking about work all the time, you tend to neglect your family and your friends and you live an unbalanced life. So there's that problem. Hmm. But, you know, always having what you're working on in your mind is not automatically a bad thing hmm. if, it's pro if it's motivated by the right sort of motivation. At least that's the way I think about it. And in the way that you think about it, right, that... I know what you mean that there is a nobility in in production, like an inner drive to um, be motivated to create something better for others, versus a consumptive um, orientation towards maximizing. Is that a rough uh, a, designation yeah. that you like to make? Yeah. Yeah, you know, you're you're not interested in writing this book so that you can sell a, a great book, so you can sell a million copies and buy a house by the ocean. You're interested in writing a great book because you want the world to have a great book mm. that it wouldn't have unless you wrote it. Uh, and if it turns out that the book 
actually does well, well, that's just like the icing on the cake. That's not why you did it. Um, I've written a bunch of books for popular audiences. Most of them, if it wasn't for my family, no one would have read them. (laughs) Well, I've had my share of failures. And I was, I am just as proud of the failures as I am of the successes because I, you know, when I finally let them go, I was really, I think I thought I had achieved what I was trying to achieve. It was disappointing that the world didn't um, pay more attention to them, but I wouldn't do it differently the next time to to get more, to, to, to produce a bigger success. Um, if you're trying to write bestsellers, it's a whole different story. Then, then uh, you'll do whatever it is that people demand of you, even if it ends up that you produce a piece of crap. Hmm. And the occasional really, really lucky person manages to do things that are excellent and popular. Hmm. But that's certainly not standard. I tell I wanna... any junior young people who decide they want to write you know, academics who decide they want to write a book for popular audiences. Uh, I, I Listen, I, I think it would be great for you to write a book on that topic. I think the world really could use what you have to say. But let me warn you, it's almost certainly going to be a failure. So you need to make sure going in that what you're that you have expectations such that when you finish the book, if you think you've written a good book, it will no longer. It won't matter how many people read it. You will already have succeeded, hmm. uh, and it's hard because you know you have people like Malcolm Gladwell who writes about social science, and every book he writes is a bestseller. And you know he's self-taught, and if he can do it, why can't I? You know he barely knows what he's talking about. I know more about this topic than anyone in the world. Hmm. So you have this standard. And when you fail to meet it, you think that you have failed, which may not be a, at all true. So, so I try to warn people to have modest expectations. Yeah, you know, you. This is a quote you gave from your super famous TED talk that quote: "The secret to happiness is low expectations." Yes, and, and you know, one of the things that. I, I was also so interested in in terms of the research for the book, and this is purely from an a business economic perspective. Is and I don't know if the study has been replicated, but you tell the story of I think it was Stanford who did this re- research on choice and what the number of choices available to a customer does to action of actually purchasing an item. And there's a jams, right. Um, study that you cite where I think it's something like 30 jams on display versus six jams on display. I want you to speak about this, but my understanding is that the 30 jams on display attracted more interest, more eyeballs. But if you actually look at the sales figure, less really is more that having far fewer things available for people actually led to more business decisions and more business in general. It it really brings me back to the 80-20 principle, the idea that less is more, and that I think perhaps many businesses would be wise to keep this idea in mind when they're designing their business strategy. I think so too. And and I did talk about that study earlier in our conversation, and you have you got it exactly right. Um and um and it, you know, it they didn't ask in that study how much people like the jam. They just mm wanted to see how many people bought the jam. Um, but I think the the problem of comparison, which jam is what turns people off. And uh, so yes, less is more. But here's the thing. Somebody walks into your little grocery store and says, I'd like a bottle of Royal Crown Cola. I don't even know if that still exists. Hmm. You know, everyone in the world drinks Coke and Pepsi. This person wants Royal Crown Cola. Well, it turns out you have limited shelf space. You don't carry Royal Crown Cola. So you say, I don't have it. And the person walks out empty handed. It is a salient demonstration to you that you have lost the sale by not having a product. Much less salient 
is, you know, it's Walmart and you have everything. And people walk out with $20 worth of stuff instead of $50 worth of stuff because you've tortured them. As you're ringing up this person's purchases, you don't know that if you'd made, if there were fewer options, a person would have bought more. Uh, so the, the problem of too much choice when people are buying is less easy to detect than the problem of too much choice when people simply walk out because you don't have what they want. Hmm. And I think that really is very salient to people. And it just keeps pushing people to produce more and more variety. And there are other factors, too, that have nothing to do with the psychology, right? Every linear foot of shelf space that Coke has in the supermarket is a, sh a linear foot of shelf space that Pepsi doesn't have. So the more different products Coke can deliver to grocery stores, the more they can crowd out the competition. Hmm. So there's some of that, too. It's a, it's a strategic business decision. Even if they sell less, Pepsi will sell even less because Pepsi doesn't have the shelf space that it would like to have. So, you know, there's a, and, and then you've got mid, sort of people who manage inventory and um they realize that if you simplified your product line, they might be out of a job because there's less inventory to manage. So they're pushing always for innovation, new products to make sure that there's always going to be a place in the company for the job that they do. So it's not all about the psychology, but there is this deep ideology that when you add options, you make people better off and you're more likely to get people to a state where they actually buy something. Hmm. Uh, it just seems logical. And uh, economists tell us not only is it logical, it's just true. And what my work shows is that it isn't true. Um, and uh, it was quite a shock to economists when this work first started to appear. Hmm. You know, I want to double down on one of the subjects we've talked about today, which is how you convince people if they are reachable at all about why or how changing from a maximizer to a satisficer of of making decisions that are firm are is a wise act for them it seems to me that it often is counterintuitive to people in this domain of life you know i've i've done a lot of episodes this year about you know dating and that's certainly a domain i think where that can occur, where people just don't make decisions and time and options just go by. And there is this relentless pursuit of trying to find perfect and no decision gets made. And the message to people like that who are kind of stuck in this wheel, I think would be something like the wise decision for you to gain the benefits from having a relationship would be to at some point make a call and I, that must be an area of you know, your expertise and definitely related to the book that i would imagine many people seek your counsel out related to that how do you just to go over this one last time how do you think about approaching people like that who have these have habits of mind where they just have a very hard time agreeing with the wisdom of reducing their choice architecture so that they're actually constrained in some capacities so that choices are actually made, even if they may not be the perfect choice for them. Well, so I haven't had a lot of experience with that. Mostly people mm -hmm. who get in touch with me are people who are convinced by the arguments and don't know how to actually use them to change the way they live. And there I have, you know, suggestions that not a whole lot of empirical evidence behind them. So you can choose one area of your life and commit yourself in this one area, grocery shopping, hmm. be a satisficer. And, you know, that's going to be hard, too. But at least it, it doesn't make all of your life hard. You, you're continuing to make decisions in the way you always do in other parts of your life. But in this one part of your life, you're doing it differently. And if I'm right, you're discovering that you're losing nothing and gaining a lot. Hmm. 
And having taught your, uh, discovered that about yourself, now you try it in another area of your life that is maybe more important to you. And so rather than, you know, deciding that starting tomorrow, you're going to be a different person across the board, you decide you're going to be a different person in just one part of life and see how that feels and see how good you can get at it and how much satisfaction you get out of going through this part of your life in this way. And slowly you teach yourself, you provide yourself with evidence that you're actually giving up almost nothing and gaining a lot. Um, I, you know, people who think that my whole argument is wrongheaded don't come to me for advice. <laughs> it's the people who I convince that want to know, how, well, how do I actually do it? Um, and, uh, and, you know, so that, and again, as I said a, a second ago, there's not a lot of empirical evidence about the kinds of interventions that actually are effective. But that seems like a sensible way to go about it, to do it in small steps rather than in one giant leap. I'm afraid I'm going to have to go. Totally get it. I want to say just, I think your book, I used this word earlier that it's evergreen and I just have personally gained a lot out of it. And I think what you just said is how I would like to approach different areas of my life with this mentality. Um, Barry, I, I know you're a busy man and I really appreciate you giving me the time to do this. It was a real honor and pleasure to do it. It was a pleasure for me too. Yes. Wonderful questions. It felt like just two friends talking and, uh, uh, and again, I'm sorry that it was so hard to actually find a time for us to do this, but I'm glad. Worth it. Me too. Thanks so much, Barry. Sure. Take care.